I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Al Jackson. Al has his doctorate in relativistic astrophysics from UT Austin. So he went to work for NASA and of course went into flight crew training. Um, emission planning software, orbital debris modeling, and engineering simulation. We at NASA know how to use people's relativistic astrophysics degrees. That's, that's for certain. Dr. Jackson has published articles in planetary physics, astrodynamics, interplanetary dust, and earth orbital debris and most importantly for what we're doing here, interstellar flight. Um, I will introduce him to give his talk, and we're looking forward to it, Al. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I want to say when I put down this topic, I uh, did not know the movie was coming out this month. So I'm not here uh, on the behalf of Warner Brothers or Paramount. So, <laughs> This is going to be about traversable wormholes, which I haven't seen the film yet, but it's in there. Um, I want to point out that this is an, an actual wormhole that's been traversed. <laughs> uh, the next slide. So I'm going to do a little history, talk about metric engineering, and then manufacturing of uh, those uh, wormholes. Uh, I'm not going to talk about rotating wormholes. Uh, wormholes and other theories of gravitation. Time machines uh, are associated with those and in fact you may default get a time machine from a wormhole but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about warp drives which also evolved out of uh, traversable wormholes. Okay, the next slide. Okay, this uh, is a little history. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting, the convergence of two kind of things. Uh, we first had special relativity, and then uh, after, well, that's 1906, and then in 1916, uh, general relativity uh, from Einstein. Uh, the same year that he published uh, Carl Schwarzschild uh, uh, discovered a solution to uh, the uh, field equations and uh, uh, for a, a, a static spherical particle. Running along on the, on the other side is a, an element of this story that we don't usually see it much of. Starting in the late 19th century, uh, or eight, well, yeah, 19th century, uh, uh, people got interested in the structure of stars, uh, Kelvin and Helmholtz, uh, then Eddington, uh, uh, <coughs> the gaseous interior of stars. Uh, very interesting thing that happened was that uh, Chandrasekhar, uh, used uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics uh, to put together an equation of state for stars with very high, uh, well, for white dwarfs, essentially what it was. And um, there's a controversial story that surrounds this, but uh, between him and Eddington, but it turned out Chandra was right. And then, <coughs> That was in 19, about 1931, and then in the late 1930s, uh, Oppenheimer got interested in this problem of what happens if you assemble even more mass in one place. If you pile more matter on a white hole, on a white dwarf, you know, what happens? So <coughs> he and, uh, 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 Volkov uh, discovered, well, using some work of Tolman, that uh, if you put enough matter in one place and squeeze it down, that uh, the electrons merge with the protons, you get neutron stars. Uh, this uh, 
was all worked out better later. But remember, this is using equations of state and uh, uh, the hydrodynamic equations to find out how much mass you can put in one place. And then in 1939, uh, Oppenheimer and Volkov uh, went one step beyond neutron stars. And one of the things that kind, of, kind of stopped them a little bit was that uh, there wasn't enough uh, uh, quantum, uh, advanced quantum field theory and, and, and quantum mechanical properties of, uh, of matter at high densities. But they found the solution that, and they didn't say anything about black holes, they just called it continued contraction. Now, that, this is an interesting story because Einstein and Rosen uh, did a paper in 1935 where they, uh, they were, actually Einstein was really interested in trying to model particles as just pure space-time and uh, produce the thing called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. It's interesting, I don't know that Einstein ever read these papers or if he knew anything about it because the Schwarzschild solution, you know, mathematically leads to very queer uh, uh, properties. Uh, there's the, beside the event horizon, there's an essential <coughs> singularity in the center. But see, he didn't think that you could make them because he had no idea, I mean, he, he didn't think that this kind of, about this kind of stuff here. So, one reason for him rejecting it all those years was that he just never uh, thought that anybody would solve the equation of state problem when you had really strong gravity. <coughs> then there's a 20-year gap, and, uh, and actually this, both of these really can so can coincide, mainly due to World War II. Uh, John Wheeler, in the early 50s, in about 1955, got interested in uh, general relativity. He was interested in things called geons, but the, ma the main thing that came out of this was that uh, he also apparently looked back at the Einstein-Rosen paper, was trying to make, uh, well, uh, elementary particles, say like an electron, just out of uh, space-time, out of geometry. It turns out Wheeler also got interested during this time in the equation of state beyond what Oppenheimer and Schneider did. And uh, then the discovery of quasars got everybody interested in strong gravity fields. And then uh, <clears throat> in the early 60s, using uh, the best uh, you know, field theories that they had at the time to come up with equations of state combined with the uh, Einstein equations, I mean, the, of a, a gravity field, they, uh, they continued this work of Oppenheimer's and, and then we eventually got uh, black holes out of that. So remember, this comes not only from the geometric considerations of general relativity, but also from equations of state. Still a problem which is not solved today. There are a few physicists who don't believe in black holes and think that they stopped at like quarks or maybe prions or some other kind of thing. But nobody's come up with a good model because you can always pile enough iron in one place to always overcome gravity. Uh, and then Wheeler stuff, well, that's the story, leads to, in 1987, to uh, Morris and Thorne and traversable wormholes. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to put in a little math. Uh, what you do in general relativity, what you do in field theory, even classical field theory, is uh, you have the field on one side and you have the sources on the other. Usually you specify the sources here and here and you solve for the fields. Um, turns out that um, <clears throat> This is what uh, Schwarzschild did in 1935.
did. Uh, what he did was really simple, picked spherical coordinates and then made the boundary conditions that you see a Newtonian gravitating particle when you get a long ways away from uh, the, the, uh, the source. And then that led to uh, the thing that when you're, you know, when you're close to the uh, gravitating object, that you've got a very singular type of surface here called the event horizon. Something that was known back I think as far as the 17th century. Next slide. So, from knowing the spark shield uh, uh, solution, uh, it, strangely enough, a guy by the name of Ludwig Flom, and, and also in 1916, uh, noticed that if you uh, Actually, all my equations went away. <laughs> Pictures up there. Uh, that if you fix time and the angular coordinates and solve for what kind of surface that you get, it turns out to be a paraboloid, which seems to be washed out on here. But if you rotate that around uh, the z-axis there, you get a uh, hyperboloid of, of one sheet. And this is the thing that Einstein was interested in. Next slide. So he and Nathan Rosen in 1935 published this paper. They did a little tr coordinate transform. This coordinate transform, when you look at all the details of it, actually discards the event horizon and the singularity at the center. It's really a poor coordinate system, but it, they at that time, I don't know if anybody else had noticed it, and they don't say much, there's one paragraph in the whole paper about it where they call it, they don't call it a wormhole, they call it a bridge. They notice that it connects two pieces of, uh, of space-time that are asymptotically flat on either side. Next slide. So now there's a gap. And I just want to point out that, and I've, I've, someday I'm going to try to go through the history of this. I think somebody knew somebody at Princeton in New York because, <clears throat> well, the actual word warp is due to John W. Campbell in a, paper, in a story published in 1930, uh, Islands in Space. The whole idea of warps, uh, jumps, uh, drives, uh, hyperspace, really permeates the 1930s in, in, in prose science fiction and becomes really big in the 1940s because uh, uh, Asimov used it Everybody was using it, but Asimov had this jump uh, ships in the Foundation series. In 1950, when Heinlein was writing Starman Jones, which I consider the best juvenile he ever wrote, uh, he has this <coughs> passage between our hero Max and his friend Ellie, and uh, it's essentially talking about um, multiply connected topology by taking, having two points that you fold over and you, uh, they, and they match so that when you're going through those points, it's a lot shorter distance than going all the way around. This is exactly the same um, uh, description of a traversable wormhole it kind of appears at other points in, in prose science fiction. Um, how it got there, I still don't know. I, somebody knew Heinlein, I mean, uh, Einstein and Rosen's paper, I guess. And the rest of the story is history because it was used in science fiction quite a bit. I mean, uh, well, it, it still is. Next slide. 
So we come, come back to the world of physics. There's 20 years of prose science fiction and then, then John Wheeler looking to try to find a, a geometric description of particles proposes that space-time is made of these things. This is the first picture of a wormhole that's threaded by lines of force. And he considered the whole thing geometric. Turns out, after years and years of work on this, this thing really doesn't quite work. Uh, here's the other work that he and uh, his uh, students were doing. Uh, I can't read that. There's, there's a white dwarf, a neutron star on um, there. And then if you keep trying to crank in the equation of state, I believe that the, is this radius or density versus radius, that you reach a point here where you, you're, you keep overwhelming the uh, forces of, uh, of nature that you know of. Uh, and over here, he was also interested in what happened at the uh, shortest physical length he could have, which was the quantum, which was the Planck length down at 10 to the 30, minus 35, 36 meters. Uh, you have the analog of uh, the zero point background quantum vacuum fluctuations at that level. Uh, next slide. Well, and then John Wheeler coined the word black holes in 37. Science fiction authors were using these as transports, uh, but they don't work because if you go into one, you die. <laughs> so, next slide. And in fact, I don't have to go into the details of that. The main thing was is that that the the wormholes that are created that were really the this is really an Einstein Rosen bridge which came to be called a Schwarzschild wormhole. Things are really dynamic. If you try to go into one, they pinch off. And in fact, if you push a photon through. It perturbs, perturbs the background of the, uh, of the, well, if you wanted to call it a wormhole, so that it dynamically closes off. So you can't even, sh you know, transmit information through this kind of thing. <coughs> Next slide. So, actually, I, a little story there. I mean, when I was first reading science fiction, I was completely entranced by this idea, especially Heinlein, pulled me into it, and I thought that you know I didn't. They didn't call them traversable wormholes then. Several writers were using multiply connected topology in space time for uh, faster than light travel. When I got to graduate school and discovered that the darn things were unstable, I was quite downcast. <laughs> and then in 1987, quite to my surprise, when Carl Sagan asked uh, Kip Thorne at Caltech for a method of faster than light travel to use in his novel Contact. Uh, Thorne went off and uh, figured out a way. And then he and his student Morris uh, published a paper, two pa well, the paper with another guy too later. And uh, <clears throat> what you do if you remember the Einstein field equations, is you mess around with the left-hand side with the field equations, you fix up a geometry that you want, and in this case, you know, the fundamental thing in the curved space-time is the metric, is that you find two functions, a thing called a redshift function, <coughs> a thing called the shape function. The shape function you want to have so you can be, make it traversable, the redshift function you have because you want to eliminate an event horizon. Because if you go through, uh, you won't be able to come back. Uh, and so, <clears throat> every, the, what these things, they, they obey all of these rules here. One of the more important ones is that there's a limit on the tidal forces. There's two kind of solutions. 
ones that are intra-universe, where it means you go from one place in this universe to another place in this universe, and then there are inter-universe ones. It's not clear nowadays because there's multiverse uh, theories what they meant by going from one universe to another, because you don't want to go from one universe that has a set of fundamental physical constants to one that has another set of fundamental physical constants, you probably will be destroyed. But the region here has to, uh, around the throat, has to satisfy uh, certain conditions, so that's usually kind of a thing that's out. The ones you really are interested in are those. Next slide. Uh, so the metric engineering theory is that uh, you take the the gravitational field equations, this is 10 nonlinear coupled differential, partial differential equations. Uh, you specify what you want over here, and you solve for the stress energy tensor over here. And the things that are important are, are like the energy densities, uh, the tensions and the pressures, and those are things sort of similar to material mechanics where you have tension and pressure on a uh, solid object. Well, the result is that you, you find out that you need to have either negative energy or negative mass or negative energy density. That happens to uh, violate uh, one of the some of the classic energy conditions in general relativity. However, uh, quantum field theory comes to, arrest, to, to the rescue. Next slide. Uh, oh, okay, let me say this first. There are at least two ways, probably more than that, to make a traversable wormhole. One of them is that you grab one from the quantum Planck foam, uh, and that means going down to 10 to the 30 minus 35 meters, you know, God knows how many orders of magnitude smaller than the atom. I mean, the atoms are what, about 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. So, you know, you're just orders and orders of magnitude. So, if you compare that to what energy you would have to probe that length that, that's, uh, that's like 10 to the 16th TeV. Well, the, the LHC right now only does about 10 TeV, and it cost about $10 billion. I figured on a growth curve of about 0.02% per year that in 1,500 years you would have the money to build an LHC that could probe that length. Um, how you grab a thing like that, I don't know. And the whole idea is to grab it, pull it out, and enlarge it. Another idea would be that you find a uh, just a feral uh, or a leftover primordial uh, wormhole from the Big Bang. Uh, next slide. And so the other thing that saves you in a way is that there really is a source of negative energy density, and that's the Casimir effect, which means which was calculated by Casimir back in 1948. And uh, quantum field, the simple way to explain this is that if you had a vacuum here and it had nothing in it, you would have uh, zero point fluctuations in the, uh, in, the, in the vacuum. If you put two plates there, it changes the situation. Outside, you still have the same situation, but inside, you've essentially created ener a negative energy density. This has actually been measured um, in, into recent times. So the idea is that you, uh, how you do this, even Thorne doesn't say. Uh, so here you have, what you do is, here's one thing he said that to do, was that you take, you, you get a, 
say, uh, oh, four light years worth of space time and you rip it up and you relay it as a carpet like this, and then you poke a, punch a hole in, I mean, uh, down onto it and connect it to a, to another punch on the other side, and then you line it with negative energy. You know, I mean, I guess you go down to Walmart and buy a can <laughs> of negative energy. <laughs> I don't know. And the um, bad thing right now is that for like, here's a, an example, for a throat radius of one meter, you need like a Jovian mass of negative mass. Uh, the next slide. Well, the interesting thing about this, after having come to the fore in science fiction as a method, it seemed like that the laws of physics disallowed the creation of these things. But uh, Born has now shown that uh, classical and quantum field theory allow the existence of them. How you would build one, uh, or make one, or whether a sufficiently advanced civilization, which was the thought, could, uh, could build one. Well, it's, it's possible. The laws of physics do allow it. In fact, the things are observable. Um, yeah, your brother's name is on that paper there. If you look at uh, at wormholes, uh, they'll instead of focusing white, they'll defocus it, so they would be they would be observable. So that's where things stand right now. It's possible that a super civilization might have built one of these things or found one and made it bigger. Well, thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? I mean, you know, it's such a simple topic, right? Um, okay, we've got a question right here. Uh, shall I just speak up? No, no, he's bringing the mic. Right. Behind you. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Very interesting talk. I guess everyone in the room knows that Kip Thorne is the technical advisor for the... Uh, the mic's not working. Oh. I'll be back. Okay. Here, I'll do it. Nope. Is it working? Should be. Hello? You got it. <clears throat> I suppose everyone in the room knows that Kip Thorne is the technical advisor for the new movie Interstellar. <laughs> and um, so he, he no, has a very credible... Spoilers, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he, he's, he's a very uh, credible guy who uh, really has the credentials. Um, I, the want, <laughs> I wanted to remark, uh, I enjoyed the talk. Uh, I think the Casimir effect that has been observed is for quantum field theory, uh, uh, QED. Uh, it's an uh, electro, uh, uh, electronic observation rather than gravitation because the, the uh, quantum gravity hasn't been proven yet. Any other questions? I do, please. I, I don't see any hands. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah.